Mark chapter 11, verse 20, And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling in remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And this is the key verse uh, this morning. Therefore I say unto you, Whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. There's a story of a man who, won, he was a wealthy man, but he wanted to be richer than the king. He wanted to be richer than the king in the area that he lived. So he went up into uh, a mountain, and there was a, a, a wise old man that lived there, and uh, he was known to be able to give good advice and sometimes be able to help people out. So he went up into this mountain, and he found the old man, and he said, I want to be richer than the king. And this old man, of course, this is a fable, this isn't true. The old man gave him a bag with a coin in it. And he said, this is a magic bag with a magic coin. He said, when you take the coin out of the bag, another coin will appear. And every time that you take the one coin out, another one will appear in the bag. And, and you can do it for as long as you'd like, and you can keep taking out coins until you are wealthier than the king. So this man took the, the magic coin and the magic bag. He went home, and he spent the whole day taking out coin after coin after coin started to get a huge pile of coins in his house. Came to dinner time, he didn't take time to eat because he was too busy taking out the coins, taking out the coins. Day after day, this man was taking out coin after coin, creating a huge pile of wealth. Eventually, he became wealthier than the king. But he continued to, in his greed, take out coin after coin. He began to wax skinny. He didn't take time to eat. He got sick. He looked like a potter, his hair was up, his hair was long, he was all dirty and nasty, he never took time to shower, he never, because who would take time to shower or eat when you have a bag of money that every time you take a coin out, a new one appears. Eventually he became ill because he didn't take care of himself and he died. And when the people of the village found him, they said, look at this man, he lived like he was in poverty, he lived like a beggar, even though he was wealthier than the king. What good did his wealth do him? Many people today are unhappy, they're stressed, they're in debt because they have not learned how to control their appetites. They haven't learned how to control their wants. <clears throat> Through this lesson, we'll look at some verses and some principles that will help us to allow God to control our appetites. Being rich in general is when our haves equal our wants. Being rich is when your haves equal your wants. If you want what you have, then you have all that you want. There are two ways to accomplish this then. There are two ways to become rich. Either you trim your haves to equal your wants, or you can trim your wants to equal your haves. In general then, discontentment can simply be solved by wanting what you have. Discontentment can, in general, be solved by wanting what you have. So the science of appetites, we're going to look at um, some different topics, and each of them are going to be... Um, Groups of threes, groups of threes, and I hope this will be helpful. The science of appetites, the science of wants. The first group of three, there are three things in this world. There are three things in this world. Number one is what I have. Number two, what I could have. And number three, what I cannot have. So there are only three kinds of things in this world. What I have, what I could have, and what I can't have. Let me give you an example. So some things that I have, I listed some things that I have in my life. I have my family, my wife, my children, my dog, my brothers, my mom, my dad, my grandparents. Those are the family that I have. I have this job. I have my house. I have the vehicles that I currently have. I have my tools and I have my toys. I have my ice auger and my shack and my guns and different things. Those are things that I currently have, okay? Number two are the things that I could have. I could have a better paying job, okay? So I'll be honest, we all, there are, is a job that we could have that would pay more. Um, I could have a bigger house. Um, I think I have like 15 or 1600 square feet of livable space, not including the basement. I could live in a bigger house. I could have a nicer car. My Mitsubishi, I have to 
put my foot on the gas and the brake when I put it in gear because if I don't keep the, the gas going enough, it stalls out when I start it. I could have a nicer car. Uh, I could have more tools. I could have nicer tools. Uh, I could have more toys. I could buy a bigger ice shack. I really want a snowmobile. Or I just saw something the other day. It's called a snow dog. It's, um, it's the answer to not having a snowmobile. Like if you don't have a vehicle, like a, a pickup truck where you can put a snowmobile in the back or a trailer. It's basically a, uh, a snowmobile track, but you can hold on to. It's, it's like a lawnmower with a snowmobile track. And you can sit in a sled. You can put like your ice fishing gear. And then if you push go, it'll pull you. And it's pretty cool. It goes like 20 miles an hour. It's basically like you're riding a snowmobile in reverse. So I, I could have a snow dog if I wanted. I told, I told Kara, a brand new one's only like 1800 bucks. I'm like, if, if uh, our future president here gives us our next stimulus money, that's going to go right to a snow dog. <laughs> it's going back into the economy. That's what we're supposed to do. I'm just trying to help out. Just help out our country. Uh, so there are things that I could have. All right. Now there are some things that I cannot have. I cannot, according to the Bible, have drugs. I guess we technically could have them. Now I could go to a med cafe and, and uh, get some things. But according to the Bible, if we're looking at it from a biblical perspective, I, c- I cannot have drugs. I cannot have a girlfriend, according to the Bible. Okay. I can't have another wife. Uh, the Bible says that I should be the, the husband of one wife. Uh, I can't have a different gender. I am what I am. I'm a man, and I don't want to change that, okay? <laughs> Some people do, but I am I feel like life is so much uh, simpler, and uh, after being with my wife as she gave birth, I'm definitely happy with the contribution that I had in the birth of our... Uh, being a man is much simpler, I believe, so I'm good with where I'm at there. Uh, I can't have a different family, okay? Okay. Uh, I'm stuck with the one I got. Those are things that I cannot have. But we have to understand that. Things that I have, things I could have, things that I can't have. Number three, there are three attitudes towards my things. The first attitude is happiness. Happiness is when I want what I have. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out, and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. So happiness is when I, um, I want what I have. The things that I have, I want them. Uh, second attitude is acceptance. And that's when I want what I could have. Acceptance. So we have happiness is when we want what we have. Acceptance is when we want what we could have. Luke 12, 21, this is the parable of the man who had a a huge crop and he couldn't fit all the things that he had into his barns so he decided he was going to tear down his barns he was going to build bigger and this man was the example of someone who's just greedy having a lot of stuff is not a bad thing i don't think it's a sin to have things so when the lord blesses you with something i don't think that you should uh that you're in in sin for being blessed financially or or whatever the lord uh, trust some people with more money, and uh, and uh, I don't think it's a sin when someone has more than someone else. Um, so Luke twelve twenty one says, "So he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God." That's a summary there. This man, he wasn't taking uh, concern for his his spiritual well being. He was only worried about laying up treasures on earth. And the the parable said, "Well, you're a fool because today your your soul is going to be required of you." So acceptance is when you want what you could have. You want things that aren't bad, but you're spending your entire life trying to get the promotion or you're trying to get uh, a better job. You're trying to afford the nicer car. You're trying to get a bigger house and you're trying to always move up the corporate ladder. And what makes that a sin often is that we then neglect the things that are important. We neglect our family. We neglect uh, the house of God. And we neglect the things of God because we're always busy. So I want to make sure that we understand it's not wrong to have things. And it's, and it's uh, definitely right to take care of the things that God has given us. But I want us to see that very often the people who maybe they're not unhappy in life, but they're not necessarily completely happy, is because they're always chasing that next thing, acceptance in life. And then thirdly, attitude. We have happiness when I want what I have. 
Acceptance is when I want what I could have. Number three, unhappiness, is when I want what I cannot have. 2 Samuel 11, verse 2. This is uh, King David. He should be out to war. Instead, he's at his house. And whenever we're not where we're supposed to be, it opens up the door for us to get into trouble. And this is what happened to David. And it came to pass in the evening, David arose from his bed and walked up to the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And we know the story. David winds up committing adultery. Uh, she gets pregnant. He brings in um, her husband. He tries to make it look like uh, he got him home. He got him drunk. He told him to go home so that everyone would think, oh, well, he went home from war for a night. They obviously were happy to see each other. She got pregnant. That's what happened. It, it wasn't the king sinning. He uh, showed so much honor that he wouldn't even enter the door of the house when his men were at war. Uh, so Dave, then David had him killed. So it's a big snowball of events. And um, it was because David was, first of all, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. That's not the point. But David wanted something that he couldn't have. He's not supposed to have another man's wife. But he saw and he wanted, and therefore he became a very unhappy man. He lost children. He lost family. Many, many, many men of, of his country lost their lives because of his sin, because he wanted something that he couldn't have. And many times when we're unhappy in life, it's because that we want something that we can't have. Let's keep going. Number, th number uh, the third group of three, there are three conclusions now of a happy person. There are three conclusions of a happy person. Some of these will be a little redundant, just bear with me. Number one is I want what I have. Number two is I accept what I have. And number three is I don't want what I can't have. Psalms 101 verse 2 says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me, I will walk within mine house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. So if we're going to be a happy person, we have to come to a few conclusions. The first being, I want what I have. Number two, I accept what I have. And number three, I don't want the things that I can't have. Um, let's keep going. The, third, uh, the fourth group of three things. Uh, three things that we can do as a happy person. So now we've come to the conclusion uh, that, have, that helped us to be happy. So here's what we can do now that, that, that we're a happy person. Number one, enjoy what you have. Enjoy what you have. Ecclesiastes verse three, Ecclesiastes chapter three verse thirteen says, "And also that every man should eat and drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God." I'm gonna read that verse again. I love this verse. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It's the gift of God. The Bible tells us that we should enjoy the things that God has given us, enjoy the things, the fruits of our labors, the things that we have worked for. God, as, a, as men, has given us a job to do. And he says when you, when you work and you provide for your family and you do an honest day's work and you're rewarded for that and God blesses us because of that, that we ought to take time and enjoy that. That we shouldn't always think, okay, we got another week done, now we're into another week, and now we're into another week, and we, we another week our life away. The Bible says we ought to take some time and enjoy the things that God has given us in, in right proportions and in the right place, but we ought to enjoy the things that God has given us. Number two, don't obsess over what I could have. Don't obsess over the things that I could have. And number three, stay away from what I cannot have. We'll move on. Three dangers to controlled appetites. So what are some dangers? Uh, we're talking about the science of appetites, the science of wants. What are some dangers to having a controlled appetite? Number one is this, being made aware of what I cannot have. A danger of having a controlled appetite or a controlled want is being made aware of something that you can't have. Let me give you an example. Um, I watch a lot of sports and now, in the last couple of years in America, uh, gamble, ga betting on sports games and different sports things has become legal again. I think it always was going on. It was just kind of like under the table. Now it's just completely legal. Uh, you can go on, you can 
put money on a game, you can bet that you know the Steelers are going to win. If you would have bet that, you would have lost some money last week. You can bet that the Packers are going to win next week. You'll probably lose money on that too. You can bet on, they have it to where you can bet on just like all kinds of random things, like so-and-so is going to have 300 yards or this team's going to score X amount of points. And you can bet on literally anything. I, I was... Um, I saw on a commercial that DraftKings is one of the bigger uh, gambling deals for the NFL, has paid out over $20 billion in this season alone. They have paid out, so you know they've made a lot more than that. That's a big, big thing in America is, is gambling. Because I enjoy sports and because I think that I know a lot about sports, gambling could be a very uh, big temptation to me, all right? Um, so being made aware of what I cannot have, when I am watching the, the sports and it goes to commercial, uh, whether I'm watching them on like YouTube Live or, or whatever it is, because of my demographic, I'm a 26-year-old male, that's a perfect person that they're going to push um, gambling ads because they know they can get me, because they know I like to watch sports. They can tell by my YouTube history and my Google search, the only thing I look for is like Packers, NFL, NBA, and... Um, being made aware of, oh man, if I sign up for DraftKings this week, they're going to give me a free $1,000 bet. And that's that's one of their incentives. This week for the playoffs, if you sign up to, to be part of DraftKings, they'll give you a free 1000 bucks to bet on whatever game you want. And the different things that they're going to allow you to bet on are super easy things, and they're going to help you win some money so you can get hooked, so you want to spend some of your own money, and they get you. That could be a big temptation to me. Maybe for some of you, you think that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. That would not be a temptation to me whatsoever. It's a temptation to me. So when I see those commercials, I have to turn the volume on or I'll go, uh, go get some more chicken dip or something. So I'm not being made aware of something that I can have. The Bible says that we're not supposed to have ill-gotten gain. We were talking about this a little bit because sometimes you reason, okay, is it really wrong to gamble? Like, okay, it's my own money. I earned it. If I want to throw it away, why can't I? Investing money into a 401k or into the market is the same thing. Isn't that right? Like you're investing, you're gambling. The difference is gambling is stealing because somebody has to lose in order for you to win. So really the thing that's wrong about gambling is not what you're doing with your money. It's that somebody else had to lose their money in order for you to be able to make a profit. Therefore, you're stealing. The Bible clearly states that we shouldn't steal. And therefore, that makes it a sin. We're not arguing about whether gambling is wrong or not. But that could be a temptation to me. Therefore, I have to not look at those ads because I know very easily at 1 o'clock in the morning when I'm watching a basketball game, shaking Quinn, hoping that she does that she would fall asleep, I think, man, I'm just going to like put a bet on this game to make it interesting so my eyes don't burn out watching TV. I have to be careful. Number two, so number one, be made aware of what I cannot have. That's a danger of a controlled appetite, a controlled want. Number two, being around what I cannot have, okay? Being around what I cannot have. Where I'm just being completely open and honest, so we're just going to keep doing that. Um, alcohol, never been a temptation to me whatsoever. Uh, a cigarette, drugs, pills, never been a temptation to me whatsoever. A can of dip, big temptation. I was around it a lot when I was working um, secularly in college. And now when I go into the gas station, and I see a can of Grizzly or uh, some of the other things. Man, that's just like, you know, like I'm 26 years old. I could have a can of you if I wanted to. And that's a, that's a big temptation to me when I go into the grocery store, when I go into the, the gas station. So being around what I cannot have, if it's possible to go to a different a register maybe where I'm not staring at the racks and racks and racks of different kinds and looking at it and thinking about it and allowing that to kind of, you know, go in my mind, then I, I need to do that. I need to try not to be around the things that I can't have because I know very uh, firmly that for me that 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 would be a sin and I have to not be around it. Um, so number one, being made aware of what I can't have. Number two, being around what I can't have. And number three, being with those who have what I can't have. Being around those who have what I can't have. Proverbs verse thirteen, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools 
shall be destroyed. <clears throat> There's a couple of reasons why not to be around the people that you that have what you can't have. Number one, obviously, it could be a temptation to you. If you if you know that it's a sin for you not to have X, Y, Z, and all of your friends, all of your buddies, your extended family, they all they have the things that that you can't have, then eventually the temptation over and over again, you may cave in a, in a moment of weakness. And it's important that you're not around the people that have what you can't have. Um, and then another reason my dad always um, told us growing up is if you're with somebody who is who you know is in outright and blatant sin and you're with them all of the time, there may come a time where God decides to judge that person for their sin and if you're with them when that happens, you're going to get whatever comes along with that that judgment. He told me when we, I went to college. You know there's a, a guy or, or a group of guys who are always breaking the rules. They're always misbehaving. They're into things they shouldn't be. If you ride with them to work every day, if the Lord decides to get them in a car wreck, to you know slap them upside the head and say, hey, like you need to get your stuff together. If you're in the car with them, that you're just going to be a casualty. And it's important that we not only stay away from the people who have what we can't have so we're not tempted, but also so that if, if there's ever any uh, repercussions because of their sin, that we, we're not there when that happens. Continue. Three goals of controlled appetites. What are the goals of having a controlled appetite? Number one, don't allow the object to create the appetite. Number one, don't allow the object to create the appetite. Joshua 7, verse 20, this is Achan, the man who, when they went into war, they weren't supposed to spoil. They weren't supposed to take any of the things from the country. They were just supposed to go in and defeat um, the people. And Achan, he took some things with him and he hid them in his tent. Let's read the verses. And Achan answered Joshua and said, I indeed, indeed I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So let me show you the progression. He obviously wasn't supposed to take, they weren't supposed to take the things out. Sometimes the Lord said, you know what, go in, kill everybody, spoil it, take everything with you. And the Lord provided for his people with taking the clothes and the money and the things. Sometimes the Lord said, you go in, just take care of the, the battle, don't touch anything. We remember that happened when Saul went and spoiled and he took the king and he took some of the, the things when he wasn't supposed to. So here Achan said, I saw. Okay. And then he said, I coveted. So he saw the nice clothes and he saw the, the wedge of silver. If I saw a wedge of uh, silver, I probably would be like, Man, that'd be nice to have a wedge of silver and a, a couple of blocks of gold. So he saw them, and then he coveted them, and then he took them, and then he hid them. So you see the progression of just kind of a downward, slippery slope is he allowed the object to create his desire. He didn't go into it saying, I know I'm going to come in here. This is a wealthy country. Probably going to see some things that look really good, and I'm just going to put the blinders on so I can go in. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to get out. But he, he allowed the object the, to become and create the appetite, and therefore he sinned. He and his whole family were stoned because of it. Number two, allow God to create the desire. Philippians 2, verse 13, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. So we see here that if we allow God to work through us, that God will create in us the right appetites for the things that we should have. And then number three, this goes along exactly with number two. Make my, my wants to equal my haves. Allow God to create the desire. And then, I believe we're on the last group of three. Yep. So here's three scriptures to follow. Three scriptures to follow. Psalm 37, 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I think sometimes we read that verse and we think, well, if we delight in the Lord... He's going to give us the desires that we that we have. No, 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 no. He will give us the desires. He'll give us, he'll make us want what we should want. That's a little bit different light to look at that verse. So if we 
follow the Lord and we allow the Lord to create the appetites, the Lord will give us the wanter that we should have. And then, if we have the right wanter or the right appetites, then we can ask for whatever we want. And because we're asking for the right things, the Lord will give us everything that we want. I think maybe sometimes that our prayers don't get answered is because we're asking for things that we shouldn't be. Um, number two, Philippians 4, verse 19, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches by Christ Jesus. God will give me everything that I ought to need. God will give me everything that I ought to need. Yes. If I'm living outside of my means, if I decide, you know what, I'm going to go buy a house on Grand Lake because I want to be able to just step off uh, my yard in the morning and go ice fishing for a couple hours before I go to school. That would be awesome. I can't afford to live on Grand Lake, not even close, okay? Um, and I know that it wouldn't be the Lord's will for me to live out there right now because I literally cannot afford to live out there. So if I just say, you know what, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to buy a house, I don't care what it costs, I'm going to get a mortgage payment, it's going to cost me two grand a month. I don't make two grand a month, but we'll, we'll make it work. And then I get the house and then I beg the Lord and say, Lord, please, you know, I need $2,000 to pay my mortgage. Like, the Lord's just going to say, you retard. Like, <laughs> I've given you the job that you have, okay? I've given you a house that fits within your budget. I've given you um, the vehicles and all the things that, that you need to give by. And it fits within your in your budget. So then I went outside of God's will. I did something crazy outlandish. And then I, I begging God, Lord, please, like, this is a need now. I You said I need to pr provide for my family. Part of that's a, a, a roof over their head. I need you to pay for this mansion on Grand Lake. The Lord isn't going to give me the money for that. Because he's going to give me everything that I ought to need. My desire, my appetite, my want in that situation did not follow and fall under the category of what uh, God's will and his, his, uh, what his desire would be for me. Number three, Mark 11, verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, whatso, uh, whatso, uh, what things soever ye desire, then ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. I butchered that verse. I'm going to read it again. Mark 11, 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So once we allow God to create our desires, and we allow God to control our wanter, then the Bible says, ask for anything. You got it. Because we're allowing God to create the appetite, we're allowing, and then he will give us the things uh, that we need. Until my appetites are sanctified, sanctified is a fancy word for saying clean, it would be dangerous for me to receive everything that I want. Until my appetites are sanctified, it would be dangerous for me to receive everything I want. There's a lot in this lesson today. I hope that uh, it was helpful. I hope maybe some things, it was very helpful to me, maybe understand some things. Um, but I pray that it's helpful to you. Last little uh, original quote that I have for you, and then we're done. Don't expect others to live this way. You live this way. Don't expect others, you don't look at others and say, man, like, why Why are they, no, just you live this way, be a good example, and the Lord will bless you.